in our series titled, What COVID-19 Means for Business and Economics, facilitated by Smith's very own Dr. Nicole Coomber. Today we present the next session in the series titled, Remote Work and Emotional Intelligence, Tackling Difficult Conversations. I am Allison Schwarz, Executive Director of Alumni Relations at the Smith School, and we are working a partnership with the Smith's Office of Executive Education to power this series. We would especially like to welcome our Smith and UMD alumni and current students who have joined us today from across the world. We appreciate your time and hope you find this a valuable source of learning. Please be aware that we are recording this session in full so that we can post the digital recording to the Maryland Smith website later this week. Next slide, please. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicole Coomber. Nicole Coomber is an Associate Clinical Professor in Management and Organization and the Interim Assistant Dean for the Full-Time MBA. She teaches Organizational Behavior in the Undergraduate Program, the Management Consulting Practicum in the MBA, and Leadership and Teamwork in the Online MBA Program. She has served as Chair for the School-Wide Teaching Enhancement Committee, currently serves on the President's Commission on Women's Issues, and the University Senate's Academic Standards and Procedures Committee. She is an incoming practitioner liaison for the Management Education and Development Division of the Academy of Management, where she has also served as the membership coordinator. In 2018, she was recognized as a woman of influence at the University of Maryland and is a moderator for the annual Smith Women Inspire event. Nicole has been featured as an expert on leadership, human resources, diversity and work-life balance in CNN, HR Dive, WAMU, and WTOP. Nicole completed her PhD in education policy and leadership in the College of Education in 2012. I wanna personally thank Nicole for her support of this important webinar series. Before Nicole begins, I want to ask everyone to please keep your microphones on mute to reduce background noise. Nicole will be presenting her material for approximately 20 minutes, and then we will move into a 20 minute question and answer period. Please post your questions in the chat area and Dr. Coomber and I will address them during the Q&A time. I will now turn it over to Dr. Coomber. Nicole? Hello. Welcome everyone. Um, I don't know if you see me over here with uh, those of you that joined maybe a little early. I had a young child up here coming and asking for, I don't remember, he was talking about Minecraft. Um, I'm also sharing this workspace with my husband, um, who's leading a really important call right now, um, and texting, you know, trying to arrange different things to make this all happen. So I wanted just to stop and uh, first acknowledge all of you for being here. Um, you've taken time out of your day to invest in yourself and invest in your education. And I think that's really important. Um, to, to recognize and to give yourself some credit for. Uh, so we're gonna do a warm up activity so I can get to know you a little bit better. Um, this is what I look like in real life, you know, from head to toe, not just the kind of chest up. Um, as Allison mentioned, I'm incoming as the um, assistant dean for the full-time MBA program. Um, I've been on the faculty here for about seven or eight years, and I uh, really have a passion for teaching and especially teaching things that I think will help people in their regular life. So I'm going to go through quickly the agenda. We're going to do, this says warm up virtual teams, but it's actually more kind of broad. We're going to just do a quick warm up question about remote work and your feelings on it. Um, I'm going to talk about emotional intelligence and I'm going to do a deep dive on two particular skills that I think are most valuable in this particular um, kind of season that we're in. And then we're going to do a little troubleshooting where we take three scenarios um, that you might have encountered on the job. And um, first, I'm actually going to ask for your opinions of how you would um, respond to them. But then I'm kind of going to look through the different scenarios, different responses, and um, see how, uh, see, kind of see what the emotional intelligence research and literature tells us that we should do in these certain situations. So for our warm up, um, I want you to think about one word that you would use to describe remote work. And we're going to test out this um, uh, poll everywhere feature that I've used in my large classes and see how it works remotely. Um, so I want you to think of that word. What's one word that you're going to use to describe remote work? And um, hopefully you can see this. Um, you can log into this poll, so you can either use your phone and text in your answer, um, or you can respond to the poll, and it is blocked for me, but um, maybe Catherine or Allison, if you could put the link in the chat, that might be helpful if you can see it. 
Okay, so I'm going to activate this poll so you should be able to join. And people are also chiming in in the chat, so feel free to do that if you can't get the um, poll to work. For the way, let me just do escape out of here. Um, poll, I'm going to type this into the chat so we can do this. Poll.ev, pollev.com slash Nicole B117. So if you go to that link, you should find um, <laughs> I'm seeing some great words in here in the, in the chat. Um, oh, Catherine put that in too. Thanks, Catherine. Isolated, challenging, exasperated, focused, tiresome, surprisingly flexible. It's good. So not everything's negative, right? 24 7. That is. Um, Definitely true for me. Lunchless, sometimes hard to disengage, independent. These are great, y'all. Um, I was thinking about my own answer to this question, and for me, it's definitely been challenging. Um, neck pain, it's true. Um, there was something that was, uh, there's a great um, writer that I like, call, uh, forgetting her name, but she does the well column for the New York Times. And she described, um, her teenagers are in school um, and she said that basically online school right now is all vegetables and no dessert and that they're you know they're being having all this work but there's none of that interaction that really makes school for children um, fun right the playground time the passing your friends you know when you're getting something out of your locker um, the the kind of just general interaction and I think that some of us um, are also experiencing that when we think about remote work. Uh, there's a lot of, let's see if my poll worked. Did not, okay, pairs do not have worked. I'll go look on my, I have it pulled up here too. I'll see if it worked there. Um, it, it, it's, we're, we're experiencing all of the work side of things without having any of the fun. Um, without having the things that really make uh, make working together enjoyable. So um, you may think like, oh, I used to waste all this time chatting with colleagues. Um, I used to waste all this time, you know, having these interactions or going out to lunch. The text feature is saying you haven't opened the poll yet. Okay, well, that's on me. I will try to figure that out as we um, go to the next one. Um, Let's get on to my polls. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of, <laughs> I did try to activate the poll, Catherine. She, Catherine's texting me in the chat. She's like, you didn't activate the poll. I'm like, now what my emotion I'm experiencing is embarrassment. So we're going to talk about that, right? Um, so emotional intelligence, uh, I'm going to go into the four key skills of emotional intelligence. Um, and the reason why I think some of you are saying that there's, there's this great flexibility about working at home. The flip side of that is kind of this boundaryless, um, boundarylessness that a lot of us are experiencing. You know, as I'm experiencing, I am uh, juggling children. I do have some in-home care for my four children, um, but it's still four children and they're very young. And so that, that juggle is really challenging. Um, you know, so I think for me, the one word is challenging. Um, the flexibility, I mean, I think it's great that a lot of us have found things that we really like, the ability to focus, right? Um, without the distractions of the office, there's really some benefits that we would want to keep with us as we move forward. So one of the things that, that I think has come about as because of this new remote work um, experience that many of us that with these kind of traditional office jobs, creative class, um, anything you can do from home where you don't have to interact with people uh, face to face, um, a lot of us are experiencing some benefits, as many have pointed out. Um, others are experiencing some challenges. And um, when it comes to dealing with our colleagues and to interacting with our clients, interacting with our customers, uh, coming back to some of the kind of basics around emotional intelligence I have found has been really, really helpful. Um, you know, if I sort of had like one big idea on what I wanted to talk about today, it's how emotional remote work can be just as effective, um, just as productive as in-person work or being in the office, as long as you are using emotional intelligence when you come to dealing with yourself in, in, in the situations and also dealing with others. Um, 
what's interesting is a lot of the research shows that virtual teams, when we first started doing research on virtual teams, we found like, oh, you know, it, it, people aren't as productive when they're on a virtual team. As time has gone on, as more people have gone into virtual work, we're finding that virtual teams actually offer a lot of benefits. So some of those benefits are um, uh, being able to access globally dispersed talent, um, you know, the person that you need, the expert in your in your organization on a particular thing doesn't have to be co-located with you, right, to be able to, to tap into their expertise. Um, so there are some productivity benefits. The other thing, too, is that global teams and these virtually dispersed teams, as they grow larger, they actually find that they have fewer of the problems than a co-located team would have when they start to grow larger. So there are some definite benefits. Um, however, the uh, problems come in in that it becomes much harder to get to know one another. Um, it becomes all vegetables, right? And, and very little kind of dessert. None of the fun things that your team might have done. Even like the five minutes of chatter before the meeting, right? I've been in so many virtual meetings um, with some of my clients, um, consulting clients with my students, um, you know, within the Smith School, within the university. And, some of the meetings start out with a little bit of chitter chatter, but definitely depending on the group that's meeting, um, a lot of times it goes right into business. So there's two particular um, skills that I want to focus on um, as far as emotional intelligence goes. Um, there are four basic competencies to emotional intelligence. Um, emotional intelligence is a concept that a lot of uh, faculty and our faculty have studied a lot. Um, some people find that it's very hard to separate from personality, like what's the difference between emotional intelligence and personality. I think when we focus on the competencies, we understand um, how the, being intelligent about your emotions can help in the workplace. So the two skills that I'm going to focus on um, today are first, self-awareness. Um, we got dueling, dueling conference calls here. Um, we've got self-awareness, and this is about how you perceive your own emotions. Um, are you able to perceive your own emotions accurately? And then the second one, um, social awareness, where you're aware and cognizant of other people's emotions. Um, and this is also known as empathy, right? So being able to actually understand and, and see what people are going through and use that in the situation. The other two pieces are really important, um, and I will touch on those as I'm talking about these top two, but in emotional intelligence, the way that we kind of have seen it work is that these two skills, um, everything else sort of flows from this, right? If you're self-aware, then that starts being able to be something where you can actually self-manage. If you're socially aware, if you have empathy for others, then you can sort of start to manage emotions around a certain situation. So, okay, I am going to try to activate this now. So this says, it says activate. Um, show responses, clear responses. This activates your server. Okay, so this says it's activated. I'm gonna go into my little thing. Um, so I wanted to get a sense of what your, um, what you feel like your competency uh, is strongest. Um, so the four that we talked about, the self-awareness, being aware of your own emotions accurately, um, social awareness, having empathy for others, you know, understanding what they're going through. Um, the self-management piece where you can actually manage your own emotions um, or the relationship management piece where you can kind of like actually, you know, take a, um, take a look at what other people are feeling and then know how to appropriately respond to that. So we're getting some responses here. I'll give you a minute to do that. I activated the survey this time. I think what happened last time was I clicked activate and that actually unactivated it. So, hey, we're live, right? That's the fun of being live. So I'll give that another minute. Um, and um, one of the things, just an interesting kind of piece of research, and if you can't, you can't access the um, uh, survey, feel free to, to pipe into the chat. I wanted to give people a kind of an opportunity to respond anonymously. Um, one of the interesting pieces of research that I've kind of dug into recently on emotional intelligence is that um, People who are leaders are often very good at emotional intelligence, not always, as many of us have encountered, but people who are good leaders, right? The p one piece of emotional intelligence is that relationship management piece, right? And it's been asked and research, researchers have been looking into, does that mean that you're actually manipulative, right? If you can manage other people's emotions and kind of get them to do something because you sort of manipulate their emotions, isn't that almost like a bad thing, right? Are you then kind of engaging in some of these more dark side personality behaviors? And it's true. Um, 
there is an aspect of it. If you uh, are very good at manipulating other people's emotions because you do have high emotional intelligence, you can um, kind of become on that negative side. So something just to be kind of an interesting wrinkle in the research, right? That not, even though these things are often positive, it's not always um, the most positive. All right, so we're gonna show responses. I've got about 13 people who have um, polled, but I'm not sure how to get the results. So let me see. Count polls, okay. I've got like multiple things going on here. So a lot of people in the chat are saying social awareness, and I, I'm not surprised at that. I think um, especially women, sometimes uh, we are tuned into responding and uh, um, acknowledging other people's emotions. So sometimes it's actually that self-awareness piece that's quite difficult. Um, and uh, and then, you know, managing your piece. I myself find that I can be good at self-management, but then not always aware of what my emotions are. I'm more aware of kind of what the reaction that I'm having is. I'm like, ooh, I'm getting really frustrated or I'm getting really angry. And so I jump immediately to the self-management piece um, because that's kind of what is socially appropriate, um, but not always in the kind of empathy piece to other people's emotions and responding to them. And quite honestly, like just dealing and sitting in the emotion that I'm experiencing to begin with. Um, all right, so let's see, what was this called? What's your EI? All right. Let's see if I'm looking on my other screen to see what our responses were. Okay. I'm not seeing how, we can see who's responded, but we are not seeing what their responses are. So we'll go on to the next one. I'm hoping the next one will work a little better. The, um, there's a polling feature in, um, in Zoom, but you can't use it as a co-host, as I discovered on the last webinar that I did. So to that piece of um, developing self-awareness, one of the most important things um, that we can do is to actually link up what we feel physically in our bodies with emotions. Um, and I'm going to uh, give you a little resource on this because uh, it, it can be quite hard, especially if we've been trained or, or socialized not to kind of experience the feelings that we've, we're experiencing, particularly with negative feelings, right? If you um, have been socialized to believe that like showing anger is negative, um, to, to crying um, being negative, um, you might have trained yourself uh, to not show those emotions. And so it can be very hard to tap back into your physical experience of your emotions and really understand what you're feeling. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a little resource on that and, and um, kind of turn you in the direction of one of my favorite kind of psychologists who does some work on, it, on Instagram who's really great. Um, but I think developing body awareness um, can be a very um, powerful way of developing that self-awareness to know how you're reacting in certain situations. Um, there's also uh, identifying specific emotions has been found through journaling and other um, practices be to be really powerful. Um, people who have this journaling practice have been found to be more effective leaders. Um, and the other thing too is that uh, being vulnerable is often something that can be beneficial, kind of talking about what you're experiencing. Um, one kind of wrinkle to that is that there is um, some negative aspects of oversharing. My colleague Jenny Marr has done some research on oversharing, um, particularly when you're a leadership position and how um, it can hurt uh, task-oriented leadership aspects. Um, so if you have a very task-oriented style of leadership, switching to kind of an oversharing can be a bit problematic. So you want to be careful. You know, you might want to do something like um, showing your team kind of your workspace or talking about kind of the day-to-day the -day frustrations you're experiencing, but, but maybe reserve um, kind of the more intense emotions for a more appropriate time. Um, I think we, we think vulnerability, oh, it's this great key to building rapport. It can be, but it kind of, you have to limit it. Um, so this is an emotion sensation wheel, um, and so you have in this, this woman, um, Lindsay Brahman, um, she is a therapist on Instagram, I'm going to put her name in the chat for you, and um, she does these great little visuals, I became a, a patron on, of her on Patreon, because I really loved her work so much, so that I could use these, um, and I'm just typing this here in the chat. Um, so this emotion sensation wheel, it's really cool. And she actually has one that you can fill in yourself. Um, so you link kind of what you're actually feeling um, into kind of these uh, more intense emotions. Um, and so right now, what's uh, sweaty? 
you know, kind of sweaty, flushed, right? I'm not angry. I think I'm more like a little fear, nervous, right? Anxiety, because I'm, I'm on this webinar with 80 of you. Um, and so this can be a very powerful tool to help you tap into what those emotions are. When you tap into your emotions, it's a natural follow on to that self management piece, right? That you know how you might react to a certain situation. And so you can better kind of anticipate that and figure out um, what might come. So I'm going to skip over this because the polls have not been working. Um, so the next piece is to develop social awareness. And this is incredibly important in virtual teams because one thing that can happen in virtual teams and co-located people is what we call this illusion of transparency. Another way of referring to it is projection. We tend to think that if we're experiencing something, um, if we are struggling with something or if we uh, find something easy, that other people within our circle also understand it, also feel the same emotions we do, um, and that they are right on board with that, right? That they are feeling what we're feeling. Um, that illusion of transparency can cause some communication issues. I think that the biggest place that I've seen this um, has been in the disconnect right now between people with small children at home and people without small children at home. Um, there are a lot of people that I work with making very blanket statements about what their work life has been like at home. And there are many other people whose experience um, has not necessarily reflected that. Um, and so one way to address this is to kind of like use an inquiry mindset to ask questions um, of what people's experiences actually like uh, and to see, you know, what are they experiencing rather than kind of trying to put um, your your experience on that. So asking questions or presenting like, hey, here's what I've been experiencing. Are you experiencing that too? Or is it different for you? And really listening to the answer. Um, the other thing too is when you're talking to people to speak their language, right? How do they like to be presented information? Um, is it visual? Is it storytelling? Is it data? Um, is it a phone call? Is it a Zoom chat? You know, how do people um, want to be presented information? And then finally, one of the other reasons that it's so hard for us in this moment to develop that empathy and social awareness is because we're lacking what's called channel richness. Channel richness is the amount of information that is conveyed through any particular medium. Um, and so if we are on a Zoom call, yes, we can see their face, but it's delayed, right? Or people aren't looking right at the camera. Um, if we are an email, obviously you don't have the tone of voice, you don't have the facial expressions, you don't have the body language. So you have to think about you know, how each medium might be problematic. And one thing that I've been doing is like, if I'm texting back and forth with someone, in fact, it's happened with a friend like down the street, right? Um, and I realize that there's a disconnect, picking up the phone, at least you're getting that tone of voice in, at least you can demonstrate that you're listening to them. So understanding that that channel richness can really help you in building your self-awareness when we're kind of not necessarily co-located. So channel richness is kind of that amount of information that's conveyed through that particular method of communication. So um, at work, uh, I do want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for questions. I've got three scenarios. And so what I'll ask you to do is um, uh, kind of take the scenario and maybe throw some answers into the chat and I'll kind of react to some of those. So our first scenario that we'll look at is scenario one, right? Um, you're remote. Uh, you're really struggling with something and you need to ask for help. Um, how do you think is a good way to ask for help, kind of keeping these emotional intelligence, emotionally intelligence competencies in mind? How would you ask for help from a supervisor or for a teammate? And I'll give some folks a chance to respond in the chat with some, some ideas. Pick up the phone. So pick up the phone. We've got some more channel richness, right? Um, ping them to see if they have a few minutes of chat, right? One of the um, email, include details, be specific, send an email or an IM, video chat. I like this. So how is young in the chat said, send an email to make an appointment. Um, I like this because, so we thought, we talked about that illusion of transparency, right? Um, I did actually pick up the phone and call someone yesterday. It was during working hours. She works in HR. It was a, you know, she picked up the phone right away and we solved our problem. Um, you know, but one of the problems with picking up the phone is you, how well do you know that person, right? Um, if you pick up the phone at nine o'clock and you call me, you will have four screaming children in the background. Um, and so you do need to be mindful that illusion of transparency um, can be problematic, right? Where if you think, oh, they're available, I'm available, they must be available, right? Um, so scheduling an appointment, um, especially if you are asking something for them. 
um, to kind of figure out uh, when's a good time for you to meet. That's really important because it demonstrates that you're respectful of their time. Um, some of the other things that people, I'm scrolling back up, um, scrolling back up to how I was young. I really liked what you said. That's why I wanted to scroll back up to it. Um, being specific. And then I think the other thing is, okay, so yes, this is the other thing I like. So if you schedule that appointment, don't be afraid to do the phone call, right? Just because everyone's on Zoom, don't feel like you have to jump on Zoom. A phone call is perfectly okay. Um, and then small chat, you know, do the kind of our small talk um, back and forth, right? Of how's it going? You know, what's, what's, what's been going on with you? Are you plans for the weekend? Are you going to travel? Are you taking any time off? Right? Um, the other thing is, is that when you are asking for help, particularly if it's a very busy person or a supervisor that you need help with, um, it is really helpful to be mindful of the demands on their time. Um, so one way that you can, you can do it is to sit before you send the email to ask for help, sit and think about what it is that you need. Um, sometimes I have found that talking to a, like a neutral person, like a neutral friend to help me like work through what it is that I actually need before I then ask for help is really helpful. And here's why. If the person that you're asking for help is already overwhelmed, another request might just kind of, you know, be way too much for them. If you propose to them though, I need help and here's the specific way in which I need help and you kind of tell them how to help you, you don't just kind of put a problem on their desk and then walk away, right? You tell them how to help you. Um, it's gonna be a much more kind of emotionally intelligent way of figuring out A, how to get the most out of them, um, you know, B, like getting the help that you probably need, um, and then also kind of continuing to build that relationship. The other thing too is that a lot of people, um, <laughs> who is traveling, oh, well, maybe you're going to a park. <laughs> um, we did drive our boys to uh, Gettysburg this weekend um, to go on a little run around out in the battlefields kind of excursion. So, you know, if people are running, maybe they're going to some public place. Um, but if you're not traveling, um, maybe you're, you know, taking a staycation, maybe you're doing something like that. So just kind of find a way to connect um, on a, a more personal level is kind of the point there. Um, it's really, uh, a lot of people are either like overwhelmed or they are, um, they might be kind of experiencing like different things in their lives. Maybe they're sitting around bored um, and they're, you know, all, they're very happy to help you. Um, but you definitely want to check in with that first, right? To see if that's, um, if, if that's something that they can help you with. Okay. So let's go to our next scenario. And... This is more of a supervisor to employee situation. So your team lead, one of your team members is suffering from a personal issue, but has not raised it with the team. So you're aware of a situation um, and you, uh, you know, need to address it with them. It's affecting their communication. It's affecting their work. How are you going to address with this person? And Ashley, I really like your comment. I'm going to make a comment on that. So, so chime in in the chat um, about how you might address this situation. Oops, we lost our slide. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Give a couple more moments for people to chime in, frame the discussion. So a lot of people are saying, um, you know, blank check-in quick reach out for help, um, offering help. Someone, someone on their team, this happened and some, they gave him a gift card, HR professional. Yeah, so a lot of you are bringing up great issues in this. So I think first and foremost um, is to, get a sense of the situation. What are the effects of what this is having on um, the team uh, on, you know, the issue? How are people kind of, so I, I might even kind of check in with other, not talk about the person kind of behind their back, but check in with all of the team members, right? Um, to just see like, hey, what are those, what are the challenges? 
um, that you're facing right now. And if it keeps coming, coming up, like, um, you know, Jeff is not communicating, right? And this is sort of something that keeps happening. Um, then it's really important to, as um, you all have mentioned, to kind of call that person and do the one-on-one -on -one check in to offer help. But you also want to be very specific. So one of the things that's um, interesting, one book that I love, there's actually two books that I love um, kind of around this topic of like using emotional intelligence with difficult conversations. One is called Difficult Conversation. It's by Sheila Heen and um, she's out of Harvard Business School. The other one is called um, Thanks for the Feedback. And so that's more about taking in feedback. Um, the one thing that managers tend to do when they have these situations is they do the compliment sandwich, right? They're like, oh, you're really great. And then this problem, and then you're really great, right? So if you go into the situation, it's really important that you do, I think the reason that people do that, it's because of the social awareness thing. You, you care about the person, right? You don't want to come and like yell at them, um, but you do need to sort of be mindful that just, um, you know, just kind of jumping in and saying, hey, everything's great, and then just kidding, it's not, right, is, is actually not very socially aware. Um, so understanding what the effects have been on the team, saying, you know, hey, Jeff, um, I've been doing one-on-one -on -one check -ins, um, with, uh, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one check -ins with all the team members, you know, um, can, can we chat, set up a time, right, be mindful of their schedule. And then one is to open up the floor and to kind of let them talk. They may be willing to just kind of tell through the situation and actually offer situation, you know, offer solutions themselves. They may have um, not felt comfortable opening up and asking for help. If they're kind of reticent, then that's when you do talk about the impact that it's having on the rest of the team. Um, and then it's sort of that let's troubleshoot together what to, you know, what we can get you that you need. Um, some people have brought up like HR. There may be situations where, you know, like it's a childcare issue or it's a sick parent issue um, where they need actually to take leave. Um, so the other thing too is it'd be to kind of informally check in internally with your organization, especially if you know kind of the genre of situation it is. Like, you know, maybe people are dealing, a lot of people are dealing with anxiety and depression issues right now because of the isolation. Um, you know, maybe it's a family issue. Uh, what are the tools in your toolkit that you can offer? And knowing what those are before you actually go into the situation is really important. I think it's also important just to listen. Um, so maybe you offer the feedback of like, hey, Jeff, you know, uh, these emails, this email didn't get sent in a timely fashion. So we weren't able to get our client what we needed. Um, and that really can have an impact on our business at a time when we can't afford to lose a customer, you know, and, and then kind of reaffirm, like, I know how important, like, our client work is to you, if that's true. Don't say anything that's not true. Um, what are some solutions that we can, like, work through together to maybe to address this? Okay. So I'm going to do the last one, and then I'm going to offer... Um, you know, open the floor to see if there's anything that you, uh, kind of an additional scenario that you'd like addressed um, and kind of how you can handle things in an emotionally intelligent way. So, oh, we did get some answers. Personally connect them. Oh, these are great. Okay. So it did work. Look at that. Um, all right. So last one is you're presenting to your client on the agreed upon scope, but she keeps adding tasks to your to-do list. How do you manage your client? She looks so nice, right? She's smiling. Hey, do this too. This is something that we address a lot in my consulting class at the MBA um, and that we do in our, our, um, our action learning projects as well. Client adds to scope. How do you address it? Okay, so um, clarify what the key risks are. Uh, revisit the scope. Yeah, so one thing, um, this happens, I mean, anyone that works in consulting or client work knows this happens, you know, regularly. It is very tempting, especially when <laughs> Lindsay says I must be stalking her clients. No, I've just worked with enough clients at this point where I'm like, it, they always ask for more, especially if you're good. Like if you're good, they ask for more. I think back to the emotional intelligence thing. 
One is to recognize that this is frustrating, um, especially when you've delivered a high quality work product, um, to take a step back and recognize that if you are being asked to do more work, especially if under the kind of the current stressful environment, um, that can be a fairly big stressor. So recognizing the stress of that, um, not necessarily out loud or, or to the client, not be like, well, that's stressful or that's frustrating, I wouldn't do that. But recognizing that, and then managing your own emotions around it, I think is step one. The other thing is too, that I've seen happen on a lot of teams, right? If you're doing this in a team setting, um, having some team norms around how you are going to deal with this and maybe even practicing kind of, not so much saying no, but saying, uh, okay, you know, a positive no of like, well, if we, you know, here's what we've said yes to you for you. If we do this, we're gonna have to say no to something practicing that in the team and having a game plan for when you go into a client meeting, what happens um, if you um, if you need to do that. Um, so one of the things that I really like, and this is from another book that I recommend to a lot of students um, and, and colleagues um, called um, How to Have a Good Day by Caroline Webb. And she does the positive no. So it's what a lot of you are suggesting. So recognizing this is frustrating is step one. But then second thing is recognizing where is this coming from from the client, right? It's probably out of the fact that you've done great work and she wants to see more. So you say, look, here's kind of the agreed upon scope that we talked about. If we take on this, then we're going to have to take out this other piece. We've committed to delivering X, Y, Z for you. We really wanna to commit to doing that at a high level. You know, so we can't take on that additional scope at this time unless, and then maybe you lay out a path forward for how you could do it, you know, adding on additional billing hours, um, changing a particular scope piece, and so then it can revisit the original scope. This can happen again and again and again, but I think if you acknowledge your own emotions around it and recognize why the client is asking can be really, really important. All right, so I know I've gone a little longer than promised, but I'm happy to take some questions as to particular scenarios that you um, have had great kind of feedback on on these particular scenarios as well thank you nicole so much for sharing your expertise here and a lot of great book recommendations man managing uh, conversations uh, we do have a couple questions here so i will get us started and just about a few awesome. minutes here um, left so um what are your top three team norms to get us started Mm, top three team norms. Okay. One is communication. Um, so how you're going to communicate um, and then expected um, expected communication protocols, like a weekend, weekday, you know, are you going to respond within four hours on Slack um, or is it via email and it's going to be within, um, within, you know, X amount of time. Uh, internal, external protocols is really important. Um, and then so that's kind of one. I think also one thing that we always recommend is tying in your own personal goals with the team norm. So making it a um, kind of a safe place for people to share their own personal goals, I mean, per professional goals within the workplace and, and how this project contributes to them is really important. And then finally, the third one I would say is that the team leader has to be the one to establish psychological safety. So we talked about vulnerability. Um, Oversharing can kind of create some problems when it comes to task-oriented task leadership, but if you share kind of small details, like you do the kind of tour of my home office, or here's something I struggled with today, um, you know, those are ways that you can kind of create psychological safety within the team so that it makes it a safe place for other people to ask for help um, or asking, you know, actually asking your team members for help. So, so that psychological safety is a big thing that we focus on in a lot of our work on teams and leaderships. Um, and Allison, I don't know, I have another question in the chat, but I can respond yes, there. Yes, or... we can address that Okay, one. great. Um, I was just going to awesome. read so it how do you... forever. Oh, oh yeah, ahead. okay. Um, so how do you build or maintain personal relationships among the team when everyone is remote? Man, that is tricky. So um, the good news is that there are several organizations that have done this effectively for years. Um, and so this is kind of like a norm where, you know, if you hop online, you hop into your regular meeting, um, sharing, the team lead has to be the one to kind of initiate this, but sharing something that is uh, personal. So 
with our online MBA, one thing that I did, and actually people really loved it, it was um, just talking about the weather where you are. So it's particularly fun, actually, if you have um, folks that are like in Brazil and you know India and the United States, and you can sort of share what the weather's like because you don't necessarily all have the same weather. You may not even be experiencing the same seasons. And so it creates these little moments of bonding where you can, um, um, you can, uh, actually kind of build those relationships. I think also kind of building an icebreaker type activities, um, sort of warm ups. Uh, one kind of thing that people can share, it's like, it's like a summer camp thing, roses and thorns. A lot of my virtual teams have done this and it's worked really well. So what was one good thing that happened this week and what was one negative thing that happened this week? Um, you have to cultivate it. Um, and I think it has to be explicit when it's virtual in a way that it doesn't necessarily have to be when you're in person. Um, what we've been doing too is we've been having like wellness Wednesday where people work out together. Um, you know, there've been coffee chats. And so there's some, some folks have done like happy hours. Obviously you have to kind of gauge how open, you know, people are to that. And, and if drinking's like a kind of taboo within your organization, you might want to be mindful of that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of little ways. Um, I actually have a, an MBA student working on um, helping me develop a social for our, um, my professional association, right? And so some of the things um, that we've done is there's a thing called Jackbox TV where you can actually do little drawing games. And so if people are on Zoom, they can take their phone and do a game. Um, some of those things could be little ways to blow off steams. Thank you so much. We have one last question. I think you can see it in the chat there. Yeah. So we'll go ahead so and have you. In most organizations, HR is not trusted by employees and not very helpful in resolving issues, but tend to escalate thoughts experiences. How to get HR a partner. Ah, oh, yeah. So there's some um, organizational reasons for that. Um, you know, a lot of times HR is brought in as kind of the heavy. Um, and so I think that this has to be one thing that I've seen recommended a lot um, in kind of the literature is that you have to have HR at the table when it comes to thinking about strategic HR, um, because your people management, how you treat your people is really an integral part of your overall strategy. Um, there is a case and it's available through like I think Harvard Business School Publishing. It's an old case, but I've taught it um, taught it for years. And unfortunately, we kind of had to retire it because it was a bit old, but it's on Southwest. And so Southwest and how they integrated their strategic human capital into their operations. Um, it's actually a really great example so that HR was pretty much sitting at the table with every single decision as to how it would affect their people, you kind of have to elevate that position into that they're actually sitting into the decision-making group of the organization in order to make the most of thinking about, um, you know, how that people can be, they can be kind of a partner rather than just coming in and, and troubleshooting the, the problems. Um, yeah, some people, I mean, there's a um, people team. It's like there's been different ways of talking about like human capital, but it's, you have to see it as a strategic part of the organization. Otherwise it's, it's still always going to be in that kind of lower tier format for the organization. All right, Allison, um, should I go to the next slide? <laughs> sure, that's fine. Thank you so much, Nicole. We really appreciate you. You have given us all, more tools for our toolkit to help us, um, with this new new normal that we're all experiencing. And I wanna thank you all for joining us. Um, the webinar you have attended today has been recorded and we'll include the slides as well. We'll let you all know when the recording is available so you can review and share with your colleagues and friends. And we look forward to hosting more live webinars in the series next month, so please stay tuned. Um, we look forward to sharing also more short courses and other learning opportunities from the Smith School of Business and Executive Education. So thank you again from Smith Executive Education and Alumni Relations. Thank you, Dr. Coomer. We are here to support you all in your lifelong learning. Please stay safe and go Terps. Go Terps. Thanks, y'all. Go Terps.